little surprised. I saw the president in the White House. I was a little surprised that there wasn't a birthday cake there to uh, celebrate the uh, second anniversary of the uh, of Obamacare. And we've all noticed that not a whole lot is being said about the uh, the new law by people who were involved in, in passing it. And I think there's pretty good reason uh, for that. The uh, after two years, it's pretty clear that. Uh, it's uh, full of uh, broken promises. Almost everything that was said about the law, uh, predictions about how it would turn out, have not worked out. <clears throat> they said it would protect Medicare. Obviously, it doesn't. It took a half a trillion dollars out of Medicare, not to make Medicare more sustainable, but to help uh, provide the cost for a new entitlement program. They said it would bring about lower premiums. We all know that hasn't happened. They said it would lower health care costs. We all know that hasn't happened. They said taxes won't go up, and we know right in the legislation there are $500 billion in new taxes. They said if you don't like your plan, uh, you can keep it. We know that's not working out. So I think we can pretty safely say that the reason the American people like this law even less now than they did two years ago is because nothing, essentially, that was promised is occurring and will occur. The, um, even in the jobs uh, front, you know, we, that's the, we all know the number one issue in the country. Analysts over at UBS, for example, have stated that the law is, quote, arguably the biggest impediment to hiring, particularly hiring of less skilled workers. And the CBO director has said that it will mean 800,000 fewer jobs over the next decade. So as we go into the Supreme Court arguments, interesting, ironically enough, I just finished a biography of Chief Justice John Marshall. It's called Definer of the nation. And of course, in his time on the Supreme Court from 1801 to 1835, you had a huge number of significant decisions defining what the Constitution means. And the Commerce Clause, of course, was a big part of a number of those uh, decisions. The Supreme Court and the nation have been wrestling with what the Commerce Clause means for 235 years. And once again, it'll be before the Supreme Court. And if you think about the arguments that will be made next week, the plaintiffs will argue essentially this, that if the federal government, under the Commerce Clause, can order an individual American to buy this product and tell each individual American what kind of product they must buy, is there anything, but because that decision the failure to make the decision to buy the product could affect the health care of someone else and is therefore an in interstate commerce. If the court upholds that, could the federal government then order you to eat carrots? Could it order you to quit smoking? Could it order you to lose weight? Because all of those decisions you could make could arguably have an effect on the cost of health insurance for someone else. Obviously, none of us know what the Supreme Court will do, but it strikes me that if this is permissible under the Commerce Clause, the Commerce Clause is essentially gone, uh, that it's uh, meaningless and kind of a, uh, a relic of ancient times. So those, those are the arguments that will be made. I think the surprise to a lot of us, and probably to a lot of you, was that the court is apparently also going to be looking at the Tenth Amendment implications of the massive Medicaid mandate in Obamacare. In my state, for example, as in every other state in the Union right now, the current struggle to pay for Medicaid at the state level is already causing college tuition to go up. I'll tell you why. The two biggest items in every state budget are Medicaid and education. As the Medicaid mandate goes up, education funding goes down, they pass that along to universities and they raise tuition in order to make up the difference. That's already a huge problem. In my state, we're going to add 
almost 400,000 people in a state of 4.3 million to the Medicaid rolls. Our Democratic governor said he has no earthly idea how they could possibly uh, handle this. So you're probably thinking, what are the constitutional implications of that? I'm not sure, but the Tenth Amendment initially, we thought, granted to the federal government specific powers and reserved everything else for the state. Maybe the reason the court wants to hear the Medicaid arguments is because they may conclude that the federal government could make states do so much in terms of their spending that they've basically taken over state budgets. I don't know. But I think that was a surprise to many that the court decided it wanted to hear arguments related to Medicaid as well. Uh, summing it up, it's a mess. This law is a mess. It's the single worst piece of legislation that's been passed, certainly in the time I've been here. The single biggest step in the direction of Europeanizing America. And look at what's going on in Europe. <coughs> we ourselves now have a debt the size of our economy, which makes us look a lot like Greece already. And then we're adding this uh, on top of it. Whether the court finds it constitutional or not, it's a mistake. There are plenty of mistakes you can make that aren't unconstitutional. And so, obviously, our hope is that the court will find this law constitutionally deficient. Whether or not it does, it was still a huge mistake uh, for our country. And as I've said before, I think if I were setting the agenda instead of Senator Reid, I feel like we would have an obligation to the American people on day one to begin the process of trying uh, to repeal this law. Let me make one observation about one other matter, and I'll throw it open. Um, you recall the skirmish that uh, Majority Leader and I had last week over, over scheduling, which of course is not my responsibility, and I indicated that if I were, if I had his job, we would turn next to the Export-Import Bank, and the Majority Leader said, well, we just don't have time. Well, you'd be, I think you already know, we don't have time to do the XM Bank, but we're going to turn uh, to their effort to raise uh, taxes on energy Monday and spend next week, uh, incredibly enough, having a discussion about what a good idea it would be to raise taxes on energy when gas is at $4 a gallon. I look at that and I say, you know, we ought to do something about the price of gas, but it wouldn't have taken very long to have cleared the X, XM Bank. There are a significant number of my members who are in favor of it, and it struck me that we could probably work that in. All right, let me uh, throw it open. Yeah.